John, we see seven sign miracles that point to Jesus as God. And uh, that's true in John chapter 5 as well. Now, this is interesting because the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, typically use the Greek word for miracle. But John almost exclusively uses the Greek word for signs. There are signs pointing to something of importance. And even looking at our English word, we see that signs have great significance in pointing to Jesus as God. So in chapter 2, we see Jesus change the water into wine. He displays divine power over creation, making something new. Then last time we were together, we saw Jesus heal the son of a royal official, displaying divine power over disease. And here in chapter 5 of John's gospel, we see Jesus healing this paralyzed, crippled begging man, and he proclaims himself the Lord of the Sabbath, which is huge. That doesn't seem to mean so much to us because we don't think a lot in terms of Sabbath, but believe me, all of the Jews did, and we'll consider that together this morning. But each of these signs is pointing to Jesus as God, as if to say, here is the king, your long-awaited king, the Messiah of the world, the Son of of God. If you're using a Bible uh, from the rack in front of you, you'll find John 5 on page 980. And let's pick up in verse 1. Now, after this, a Jewish festival took place and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Uh, you'll always see that phrase, went up to Jerusalem. They would sing their songs of ascent while going up to Jerusalem, because Jerusalem was at higher elevation. So whether you're coming from the north, the south, the, the east, or the west, you would go up to Jerusalem. We sang a song of ascent this morning, coming into the presence of Almighty God. Uh, so they went up to Jerusalem, verse 2, And by the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool called Bethesda in Hebrew, or Aramaic, another dialect similar, which has five colonnades. Now, this reservoir was huge. Uh, excavated in the late 1800s, uh, it's uh, an extreme depth of over 50 feet and was uh, an elaborate affair with five arched porches or covered colonnades. It was huge. And verse 3, within these lay a large number of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed. And then in the Christian Standard Bible, there's a bracket, and verse 3 concludes, waiting for the moving of the water. Verse 4, because an angel would go down into the pool from time to time and stir up the water, and the first one who got in after the water was stirred up recovered from whatever ailment he had. And there I have a closed bracket. Really? Does God heal in that way? Send an angel and stir the waters, and the first one to jump in gets healed? Well, he certainly could. But if you're familiar with, uh, which I'm not, but I, as I was reading, I learned that throughout the Hellenized world, this was a very strong tradition. They would build these Asclepions, temples of healing, and dedicate them to the false god Asclepius. And they had this superstition that whoever jumped in the water first would be healed. Uh, god could heal that way, but notice, depending on how you read the passage, Verse 4 doesn't say that that's actually what God would do, but that that's what these people, desperate for a healing miracle, would do. They'd try to be the first one in the water. That's why there's a footnote in all of your Bibles. Uh, if you can read the small print, that says, Some manuscripts omit verse 4. But one of those who had this strong hope, this desperate desire... In verse 5 is a man who had been there sick for 38 years. Now, uh, a lot of us aren't even 38 years old, so uh, I love it when I hear a, a teenager say, so great to see you here this morning, welcome. I say, for my whole life, and it always makes me grin, yeah, all 13 and a half years. Yes, that, now that's significant if you're 13 and a half. But to those of us who have a few more decades under our belt, we're just kind of going, really? Your whole life at 17? Okay, it's all relative, right? This man's life, 38 years of it was spent in this condition. And a lot of us struggle to identify with somebody dealing this, with this kind of disability, don't we? 
mobility. We take it for granted. He couldn't. People probably had to drag him around unless he was crawling. And then there's how do you make a living? Well, he begged for food. And then there's the problem of social isolation. We hear so much coming out of this year of pandemic about people being isolated, many still living in that situation, and I just, my heart aches for them. Then there's the issue of his hygiene, probably a, a pretty significant issue. People most likely avoided this man whenever possible. His life at best would have been difficult, and at worst would have been an agony. Verse 6, so when Jesus saw him lying there and knew he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to get well? Really? Do you want to get well? I mean, what is that? Is Jesus being sarcastic here? No, I don't think he would do that. Is Jesus being insensitive to this man's plight? No, he went out of his way to heal this man. I think Jesus knew all about his decades of hardship. And Jesus is setting the stage, drawing our attention to another of these sign miracles that Jesus is God. And in this sign, we're going to see clearly that salvation is entirely the work of God. Verse 7. Sir, the sick man answered, I don't have anyone to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. Verse 8. Jesus told him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. No Sermon on the Mount, no Beatitudes, no uh, go wash yourself. He just said, you're healed, get up, take your mat, and walk. I mean, we're, the thing that's so interesting is how little is said here. He just does it. And verse 9, instantly the man gets well, picks up his mat, and starts to walk. Can you imagine his elation, the, the sensation of walking on his own after all those years, decades? Can you imagine the, the befuddlement of the people around him? Probably if they were counting on some superstition for healing, it didn't happen very often, right? And yet, here's this one who gets up and walks. Can you imagine the consternation of the religious leaders who are watching over things on Sabbath? It's, it's just, it's huge. He gets up and he walks. Now, I think it's interesting that amongst all the things it doesn't say, it doesn't say that this man believed. He doesn't make any powerful proclamation in Jesus as his Lord and Savior. He doesn't recognize this as the Son of God. He didn't even know his name was Jesus. The man didn't contribute anything. This was all the mercy of God revealed in the work of God. And you know, that's how we come to Christ as well. No one seeks God unless God first draws him by his Holy Spirit. We speak in terms of, I was searching for the truth. I was looking for answers, and I found God, and I decided to do him a favor by dedicating myself to him. That's how we talk, but God's going, well, in your human finite perspective, okay. But really what was happening, and John explains this to us in a number of ways, is that the Holy Spirit was already working, drawing you to himself, opening your understanding, your spiritual eyes and ears to recognize your need for a Savior. Because in and of ourselves, we're as helpless as this crippled man. And some of us live in that condition for more than 38 years. It's only the mercy of God revealed in the work of God that ever brings us to the point we recognize our need for a Savior. And God works in a million ways to bring us to that point. He works through your family background. He works through your genetic makeup. He works uh, through cultural circumstances like political climate, like pandemic, like economic factors, and in His sovereignty. And this is so good. God can even work through the most harsh aspects of life. Deprivation, sickness, loss, addictions, neglect. He can use all of these hard things and more than I can even imagine that some of you have lived through in order to bring us to the point where we recognize our need for a Savior. Now, from our human finite 
limited perspective. We don't very much appreciate that God could stop all of those things from bombarding us, but he doesn't because he sees the big picture in his perfect omniscience. He says, I'm going to work through that in such a way that I receive the glory and that this person comes to understand who I am. Case in point is Mike. Uh, Mike was experimenting with LSD back in the early 70s. Any of you remember that? Not necessarily the LSD, the early 70s I had in mind. Well, Mike chose to hang with a, a rough crowd, and one, of his, one night his friends thought they'd play a trick on him. He overdosed on heroin laced with strychnine. Through his drug-induced haze, he found himself hands tied behind his back and a bag over his head. I told you, this is a rough crowd. Mike remembered that one of his crew claimed to worship demons because of the power they gave him. Was something demonic involved? It, it was bad. Here are Mike's words. At 8 p.m., I begged them to take me to the hospital. I heard a gunshot. I thought the left side of my face had been blown off. Somehow I survived that drug encounter. The next day I went to the police and sought rehabilitation. It took 17 months for the doctors to convince me I was alive. My mind was so far gone that I had completely lost touch with reality. I could brush my teeth, but I could not perceive my face in the mirror. I searched for healing in the Eastern mystical religions, but found no help or hope until some Christians came to me and treated me with dignity. They explained how one could be born again. Here's a man who thought he would never be healthy, maybe like the man in John chapter 5, and then somebody explains that he could be born again, kind of like the man in John chapter 3. And against all odds, God took a hold of him because this, this man who lived through this horrendous experience. His name is Mike McIntosh. He's the senior pastor at Horizons Christian Fellowship in San Diego, a ministry that touches thousands weekly with the gospel. Here's the point. Certainly, God requires faith. I mean, it's absolutely essential to this reconciling relationship with God because he set it up in such a way that without faith, it's impossible to please God. We can't see Jesus. We have to, by faith, believe that he died on the cross to pay for sins and rose again. It's a question of faith, and faith is absolutely essential. But here's the deal. Faith is always in response to the work that the Holy Spirit has already been doing. Like the work God was doing in the life of Mike McIntosh. You say, well, did God make him overdose? No, but God somehow used that horrendous experience to bring him to the point where he surrendered his life and is now serving God wholeheartedly. Just like God was working in the life of this cripple. Did God cause him to be disabled for all these decades? No, but God was going to work through that and through this healing to bring him to the point of saving faith. Maybe just like he's working in your life. We pray that every week God will send people here who do not know his salvation. This is a great place to come and figure out if there's anything to this Jesus called Christ. To see if the people who profess Christ actually have any peace or hope that can bring them through the circumstances of life. So it's response to work that God has already done in his amazing grace. And I'm so thankful for it. Verse 9, now that day was the Sabbath. And to us, we don't think so much in terms of Sabbath, but believe me, all of the Jews did. In fact, these religious leaders wouldn't let them forget it for a second. Verse 10, so the Jews, and, and whenever it designates, I mean, they're almost all Jews, so this is pointing to these religious leader Jews. Said to the man who had been healed, this is the Sabbath. It's illegal for you to pick up your mat. Really? Verse 11, verse 11 he replied, the man who made me well told me, pick up your mat and walk. I mean, if you can heal somebody, maybe you have some authority to say that. Verse 12, who is this man who told you, pick up your mat and walk, they asked. 
And what we're about to see in this significant sign pointing to Jesus as God is that Sabbath is for the glory of God. You say, well, what do I care? Oh, well, let's consider that because Sabbath is a lasting principle that ought to affect all of our lives. Here is Jesus taking on another Jewish power structure. He's not opposing the law of Moses because Jesus said, I've not come uh, to oppose the law, but to fulfill it. Rather, he's taking issue with the way that these religious leaders had missed the heart of God and were using the law of the Sabbath to, well, steal joy from what should have been a very joyful occasion. They missed the heart of God. These religious leaders had twisted and distorted the intent of the Sabbath. It was always meant to promote the glory of God. But from the beginning, God knew we would ignore his glory and seek our own. He knew that we would work and work and overwork in order to attain more stuff. In my neighborhood yesterday, you know how neighborhoods do this. You can have your own junk sale, I mean garage sale, or you can have a community-wide one, and we all exchange each other's junk, right? And so it's like, I got to get rid of this junk in the basement, in the attic, in the garage, and then I'm going to go get their junk and put it back here. We might as well just, you know, keep our own junk, I think. But in any case, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon of culture, and I completely lost my, my train of thought here. Um, <laughs> So we're looking to gain all this stuff, but the Holy Spirit's reminding us of the principle of Sabbath and that if we're going to have healthy relationships with God and with others, rest is going to be an essential part of it. I mean, we can all testify to that. When you've been a little short on rest, when you've done, uh, you know, Soul Survivor had an all-nighter, you've been burning the candle at both ends, mm, we're so quick to be short with the people around us. The people that we care the most about, we often treat most poorly. And so God says this is significant. From the beginning, God instituted the Sabbath. The Hebrew word for rest is Shabbat. And we get our English word Sabbath from the word Shabbat. The Sabbath was a day of rest then from six days of work, and God established the paradigm early on, six days of creation, and then God rested. Not because he was worn out, because he was setting a pattern for us that we would pause to thank God after six days of work and enjoy the fruit of our labors. What a beautiful plan. And this principle of Sabbath is timeless. It's still how God designed us to work. Now, most of us aren't under the, the Old Testament Jewish covenant in order to have a relationship with God. Nonetheless, Sabbath is still essential for those healthy relationships. We need to make it a priority to set aside time to rest and worship God. Now, when you hear rest, we like that part. Hey, I'm going to sleep 10 hours and glorify God. That's a part of it. That might be what your body is screaming for, but God's intent behind Sabbath was not just to sit on the couch for 10 hours and become vegetative. Instead, he wants us to move beyond just physical rest to the point where we have the energy to give God our best. This is important. I remember as a young person trying to eke out every moment of action and adventure on Friday night and Saturday night, and guess what? God gets the leftovers. Now that I, I'm a few decades older and I don't have so much uh, energy, I have to guard my energy on Saturday night if I'm going to give my very best to God Sunday morning. And maybe it's not Sunday morning. We have a church that worships here at noon. We have another church that worships in the gym at 4.30. And they similarly have to order their lives so that God is getting their very best uh, adoration, best attention. That's the principle behind Sabbath. So Exodus chapter 20 burning bush, Mount Sinai, do not commit murder, do not commit adultery, make no false idols. These are timeless principles of how God intends for us to live. And the fourth commandment of the ten is similarly uh, timeless. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
Holy means set apart unto God. Now, as a pastor, uh, Sundays have been my busiest day for 38 years, and so I've had to find ways, if I start early in the morning and go all day long into the evening, I've had to find a way to make another Sabbath time where I rest and focus my devotion on God. This so quickly devolves into a legalistic list of things that are prohibited. Some of you are old enough to remember when we couldn't go to the grocery store on Sundays because they were closed in response to the fourth commandment. Uh, then once stores started opening up, uh, many of us said, well, can we do other fun things on Sunday? Can we mow the lawn? Can we play baseball? What? Oh, are there still some things we're not allowed to do on Sunday? And that's what had happened here in Jesus' day. They said, oh, you can't walk more than a quarter mile. You can't carry your mat. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. And sometimes in the church, that's still our focus. Oh, it wouldn't be right. You can't, you can't. That was never God's intent. It's not in this moment. God's intent is that we carve out space so that we can give him our very best for a period of time. And you know, don't you, that just because you made it to church, and I'm so glad you did, it's such a privilege to worship with you, that that doesn't mean you've given God your best. All of us have sat through worship services and celebrations, and our minds have been somewhere else. No, God desires our best. The Sabbath principle ought to remind us to give God our very best. In this confrontation over the Sabbath, Jesus is saying, in effect, hey, the Sabbath is all about me because... I am doing the work of my Father, who is God. Look at verse 16. Therefore, the Jews began persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus responded to them, My Father is still working, and I am working also. Verse 18, this is huge. This is why the Jews began trying all the more to kill him. We're only in John chapter 5, but we've read this before. And here in John chapter 5, they're intensifying their animosity. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, verse 18 says, but he was even calling God his own father. And don't miss this, making himself equal with God. You know, probably most of us have had somebody ring on the door, knock on the door and say, hey, we're just like you Christians, uh, but we know better than you do. And I say, hold it. If you're from this church or from this church or from this organization, I'm guessing that you believe Jesus is something less than God, and I believe he is absolutely, completely equal with God. And I, you can take them to John chapter 5, verse 18, and these religious experts knew exactly what Jesus was claiming. And furthermore, I sometimes say to folks at the door, and so you're not going to convince me that Jesus is anything less than God, and I'm probably not going to convince you that he is wholly equal to God. So let's just... Leave it at that. And by the way, if you're going to go visit with my neighbors, I would encourage you just be honest and forthright with them right off the bat. And when you knock on their door, say, hey, we appreciate Christians, but we believe Jesus is less than God, that he was created subsequently and then he created everything else and that someday we can become gods too. If that's your message, then why don't you be honest enough to tell my neighbors that right off the bat and see how just like Christians they accept the message. You see, that's not what Jesus said. We don't have room for that option. Jesus is not just another good man martyred for an important cause. He's not just another of many prophets. He clearly claims to be equal with God here and again and again throughout the gospel. We'll hit this again. And that's why these religious leaders sought all the more to kill him. But because Jesus is God, his words in verse 24 are huge. Do not miss this. Uh, John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus said, I assure you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. No way. This is so good. Anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but is passed from death to life. You see, we can get so focused on the miracle of physical healing, and as these frail, 
temporary bodies start to break down. Do I hear a groan or an amen? Uh, you know, we're, we focus on physical healing, but there's a spiritual healing that leads to eternal life. And in light of that, I say, like Jesus, do you want to get well? Have you experienced this spiritual healing? Are you walking in newness of life that gives hope no matter what's going on around us? Because that's what Jesus invites us into when he says, do you want to get well? As I wrap up, I want you to think about two English words that are spelled the same but have very different meanings. Invalid and invalid. Isn't that interesting? Spelled exactly the same, but two very different meanings. And here's the point. This nameless invalid was not invalid in God's sight. No, Jesus has a divine appointment and comes to him because Jesus cared about him and healed him as a sign that salvation is available to everyone. And neither are you invalid because Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins and mine. We all start out separated from God because of our sin. Not just murder, ad adultery, uh, false idols, and abusing the Sabbath, but any time we miss the standard of perfection that God calls, that God lives then the Bible calls that sin. And the only way to be reconciled to him is through faith. So what does that look like? Well, thousands of people see the miracles of Jesus and believe because their stomachs were filled. That kind of faith works as long as everything's going well, as long as signs are performed and prayers are answered according to our will. But that kind of faith that's just generated by miracles is usually not the faith that will stand up to the really, really severe trials of life. And for that, we need to have faith in the miraculous provision of Christ. Because whether my body falls apart, and it will, whether I die of cancer or need joint replacements or have chronic fatigue syndrome or whatever it is, if I experience the saving grace of God, if I put my faith in the miraculous provision of Christ, then I'm good to go for eternity. Amen? That's what I'm counting on, but so many don't know. And so here is this cripple, this paralyzed beggar. He doesn't know much about Jesus, but when he experiences his touch, he tells others, and that's what we're called to do as well. Uh, you may not be able to answer a lot of Bible trivia questions, but if you've experienced his healing touch in your life, then you want to share that with others. We have a campus minister who worships with us uh, to international students at OSU, and uh, she tells stories about how uh, young people from other cultures, often cultures that are closed to gospel ministry, to the message of Christ, how they come and while they're at OSU, they, they're exposed to the message of Jesus. Sometimes as they're seeking to learn, uh, improve at their English skills. And, and so one lady had an ex extremely hard personal experience. And in the midst of that hardship, she wondered if the God she learned about in English Bible study could actually meet her and make a difference. And as she did, it was in the fall of this last year that she and her husband gave their lives to Christ, allowed him to change and transform them. And she experienced joy that she professed through her public baptism. That's an awesome moment. That's how it should have been in John chapter 5. The religious leaders should have been giving God the glory that there's a miraculous he healing, but here are the religious people sucking all the joy out of the moment. And God forbid that, that we focus on something other than the salvation that Jesus makes possible to every one of us. God forbid that we get so fixated on the, the facility or we get so focused on uh, some small offense we took by something that somebody said that they didn't even mean that we missed the joy of knowing Christ. Amen? That's what people need to experience when they come visit the chapel. They need to encounter the God who transforms. Let's talk to him now. As the praise team comes to lead us in a, a song of closing reflection, let's thank the Holy Spirit. You are the one we've come uh, to meet. 
Uh, You are the one who opens our spiritual understanding to recognize our need for salvation. And not just a a moment of salvation and then we're on our own, but this lifestyle dedicated to serving you where we seek to live more and more like Christ, where we we recommit ourselves day in and day out to tell others about the joyful transformation we've experienced Holy Spirit, would you make that real again in our lives? Thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross to pay for sins and rose again on the third day. Thank you for this day we set aside to give you our very best worship. Would you receive it from our hearts in these moments? In Jesus' name.